So I just finished reading Copenhagen Eyes, The Definitive Guide to Global Bicycle Urbanism by Michael Colville Anderson. If I had to describe the book in one sentence, I would say the book is about why we should create cities that utilize the bicycle as a tool for transportation and how we should go about doing so. Copenhagen Eyes is a lighter read, a bit of a coffee table book, and I enjoyed all the interesting pictures and infographics that are throughout the book. As someone who lives in an area that is very bike unfriendly, if not outwardly hostile in some cases, it filled me with joy to see pictures of people of all different types casually biking throughout beautiful city streets without the least sense of danger or fear. About a third of the book is dedicated to best design practice, which Anderson advocates to be freely copied and pasted into cities that desire to have streets that efficiently move people by bike. An earlier section of the book talked about some negative examples of how not to do bicycle urbanism around the world. I recognized one of the examples pretty quickly. Anderson talked for a few paragraphs about the ridiculousness of this bike lane in Washington, D.C. The lane runs through the center of the street, being flanked on either side by cars. I grew up in Maryland, pretty close to D.C., and actually cycled down this bike lane just a few months ago when visiting my sister, who still lives in the city. I actually was enjoying using this bike lane on account that I've become so used to having so little bike infrastructure that even the smallest consideration for bicyclists feels like a win. But the more I think about it, I realize Anderson is right. This design is pretty bad for being able to stop quickly at destinations along the bike lane. This is because you have to navigate out of the center of the street with cars all around you. And it isn't very comfortable lane to exist in either. I might have been happy with the breadcrumbs, but my friends, who I was biking with, and are not as big on biking as I am, were definitely not as comfortable. There were plenty of insights like this in the book that I hadn't considered before. If you are interested in urbanism and like looking at pretty pictures of everyday people getting around by bike, then give it a read. I largely agree with the author on just about all his points, but I wanted to talk about his stance on electric bikes. Anderson is a bit wary of electric bicycles. He concedes they can be a useful addition to bicycle urbanism with a small role to play. He also says they are great for increasing the cycling range, especially for older people who may not have as much stamina. As someone who loves bikes, but also loves my e-bike that I put together and have been riding for about two years now, I thought I would go through his issues with e-bikes and discuss them. Too fast. Anderson writes that since e-bikes can go much faster than regular bicycles, we shouldn't want these bicycles, which are essentially scooters, in bike lanes causing problems. I understand this critique, especially in the context of cities. I can average about 20 miles per hour on flat terrain on my road bike and maybe get up to 25 miles per hour for a short burst. My e-bike, however, can get up to speeds of 35 miles per hour and sustain that speed just using the throttle. I have even bragged to people that my e-bike is practically a little moped with pedals. This is too fast for sure, especially in cities with other bicyclists that are likely only traveling 10 miles per hour. I would never ride my bike that fast near other people on a bike lane, but I'm sure there are more reckless people out there that might try it. Anderson definitely has a fair point. Increased speed always means less reaction time and worse injuries when accidents happen. But sometimes I really appreciate having that speed at the push of a button. Where I live, the bicycle infrastructure is not great, and it's nice to be able to take a full lane and use my throttle to keep up with the flow of traffic or zip out of the way when I need to. But ideally, we should build infrastructure where I am not pressured to ride at similar speeds to cars just to feel safe. Too much hype. E-bike companies often market themselves as green and environmentally friendly. Compared to your average car with an internal combustion engine, they definitely are way better. But e-bikes still require a lot of resources, like lithium and other rare minerals, to produce the batteries, which still need electricity, which often comes from fossil fuel-powered power plants. I think this criticism is valid when you are comparing choosing an e-bike versus choosing a regular bike. The regular bicycle is definitely more environmentally friendly compared to the e-bike, but I think it is more useful to compare the e-bike to the car or the electric car, 
especially considering an electrified bike or cargo bike could easily replace most of the trips you would do in a car with the e-bike's greater speed and range compared to the regular bike. The electric pickup truck made by Rivian has battery packs ranging from 105 kilowatt hours to 180 kilowatt hours. My electric bike has a battery of a little over one kilowatt hour capacity, which is actually really large compared to most e-bikes. I'm no mathematician, but using the same amount of battery cells from one Rivian, you could power hundreds of e-bikes. Instead of incentivizing people to switch to electric cars with government subsidies, it would be much better for the environment to invest in bicycle infrastructure, bike share services, and public transit. Are e-bikes overhyped? Maybe, but if it gets more people out of cars and onto bikes, I think that's good. Less exercise. Up to this point, I mostly agreed with Anderson's criticisms of e-bikes, but this one is where I'm going to push back against a little bit more. Anderson argues that because e-bikes give an electrical assist from a motor, that people are going to get less exercise and less health benefits that would come from riding a regular bike. I've seen many people cite this study that was done after the book was published and found that e-bike riders actually have similar physical activity levels compared to regular cyclists and greatly increase their activity levels when switching from private motorized vehicles or transportation. Now obviously someone is going to get more exercise when they switch from sitting in their car to riding an e-bike, but I found it interesting that the people who switched from using a regular bike to e-bikes had the same amount of physical activity levels due to the fact that the e-bike riders rode their bikes for longer durations and distances. For a lot of people, even riding a regular bike can be pretty physically demanding, and I think e-bikes can be a great at lowering the barrier of entry when it comes to people improving their fitness. Elitism. Anderson doesn't spend a lot of time on this criticism, so I won't either. He says expensive e-bikes are becoming the chariots of the privileged middle and upper class, quite possibly the laziest demographic in history. Yes, there are some ridiculously overpriced e-bikes. I'm baffled when I go to my local bike shop and see an electric mountain bike for almost 10 grand. But maybe Anderson hasn't realized how affordable e-bikes have gotten in the past five years. There's plenty of budget e-bikes out there for $500 to $2,000. Even $2,000 is way too expensive for a bike. Yes, for some, that is a lot. But it's definitely a lot cheaper than a $50,000 new car. If anything should be labeled the chariot of the privileged upper class, it should be these giant trucks and SUVs on the road and not e-bikes. Whew, okay, well, that got pretty heated, but I hope we can still be friends, Michael Colville Anderson. All seriousness, I really like the book and would recommend to other bicycle nerds like me or anyone who wants a glimpse at what good bicycle urbanism can look like. Thanks.